So without further ado, I will start by introducing our first presenter. Dr. Paul K. Hill is an associate professor of Spanish at Pomona College and a specialist in contemporary Spanish poetry. In 2013, he prepared a critical edition of two collections by Genaro Talens, Tabula Raza and El Sueño del Origen y la Muerte, and has published articles in journals like Bulletin of Hispanic Studies, Hispanic Review, Hispanophila, Insula, MLN, Revista Hispanica Moderna, and Romance Notes. Paul will be uh, presenting his work entitled Cantaro, Cuenco, Hueco, Multistable Poetics and Supplementary Material in Jose Angel Valente's Container Poems. Paul, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Thank Samia, you. for, for that, um, that introduction. And um, uh, thanks as well to the conference organizers for, for creating this opportunity. Um, it's a bit early for me, but it's a, it's a good excuse to, to get my day started. Um, okay. Italian philosopher Gianni Vattimo's characterization of the 20th century as the century of poetics is especially applicable to post-Civil War Spain. A question that I believe merits more consideration than it usually receives, though, is precisely where to look for examples and evidence of these poetics. While an obvious place to start would be with what critic Rocio Badia Fumas has termed poeticas explicitas, like the ones readers often find in anthologies, or in poets' articulations of their view of poetry and essays, equally frequented sources are explicitly metapoetic poems. Many important post-war Spanish poets, including Gabriel Celaya, Blas de Otero, Gloria Fuertes, José Hierro, Eugenio de Nora, Ángel González, José Agustín Goetisolo, and Jose Angel Valente published poems about poetry itself that often engaged in one way or another in debates about poetry's form, purpose, social utility, and the relationship between poets, texts, and readers. Valente was an especially important figure in these debates, contributing through both his poetry and essays. A subset of critics focusing on his work have argued that other critics have relied too heavily on his critical and theoretical work, though, and instead advocate for an approach centered more on his poetry itself. Texts from early poetry collections by Valente, like Poemas a Lázaro and La Memoria y los Signos, revolve around the question of poetry's social utility, while poems questioning the possibility of creating confessional poetry can be found in later collections, like Al Dios del Lugar, No Amanece el Cantor, and Fragmentos de un Libro Futuro. What I will refer to in this study as container poems use seemingly straightforward descriptions of clay containers to reflect on poetry in a broader sense and engage with questions of the purposes of poetry and the forms used to convey these purposes. El Cantaro from Poemas a Lázaro, El Signo from La Memoria y los Signos, and Formó from Adios del Lugar all offer representations of clay containers and consist of three fundamental elements a creator or act of creation, a created object, including the raw material from which it was made, and a stated intended purpose. In some shape or form, all three poems exhibit a metadiscursive, metapoetic, or allegorical dimension and exemplify the result of the sort of process described by Helen Vendler in which a poet meditating on a given topic thinks serially through the topic by reframing it in poem after poem, creating an active process of thinking that generates as a result the entirely different structural inner shapes those poems adopt. These poems, I argue, fall into the category that another critic refers to as el poema como poética, which entails the incorporation of reflection on poetic practice insertada en el interior del poema, que se convierte así en una declaración de su autor sobre su concepción de la poesía. Despite their small number within the overall body of Valente's work, poems dedicated to describing objects that contain other things play an oversized role as a result of their ability to articulate an implicit poetics. And like the poems that Armando Lopez Castro has termed Valente's poemas poetica or composiciones poetica, they echo the conception of poetic language as a commentary on itself that Jonathan Mayhew explores in his study of the work of Claudio Rodriguez. 
In order to interpret a poem, Mayhew argues, one must first take into account the poem's own interpretation of itself and ultimately come to terms with the theory of language implicitly or explicitly articulated in the poet's work. As we will see, Valente's container poems articulate multiple and sometimes even contradictory theories of poetry and language. To unpack the theories of poetry presented in these poems, I will refer to a series of key concepts related to both poetry and visual studies. In picture theory, essays on verbal and visual representation, W.J.T. Mitchell refers to a class of pictures whose primary function is to illustrate the coexistence of contrary or simply different readings in the single image, a phenomenon sometimes called multi-stability. Perhaps the image most frequently associated with multi-stability is that of the duck rabbit. In this image, as one critic explains, we perceive a single figure depicted on paper that can appear both as a duck and as a rabbit, but never as both a duck and a rabbit at the same time. While for another critic, the multiplicity of interpretations is not simply a matter of selecting a reading as in a Rorschach test or of alternating between mutually exclusive readings in an either or duck or rabbit scenario. In either case, a key concept associated with reading multistable images is that of aspect switching, which requires readers to detach from their initial readings. Paying close attention to texts that can help readers identify details that can contribute to aspect switching. In her recent work on poetic attention, Lucy Alford defines this concept as the attention produced, required, or activated by a poem and divides it into two principal forms, transitive and intransitive. While the latter focuses on modes of poetic attention that are objectless, transitive attention centers on modes of attention that take an object and includes the following elements, intentionality, interest, selectivity, spatiotemporal remove, and apprehension, as well as contemplation. Paying attention to textual details also plays a key role in the work of Genaro Talens and Juan Compagni dedicated to the relationship between textual spaces and texts. This work builds upon a positing of textual space as a discursive object with a precise em empirical existence that in many cases can be organized and fixed between a beginning and an end um, to define a text as the result of a reading or transformational labor made over the textual space. For Talens and Compagni, there are as many texts as reading appropriations of the corresponding system, meaning that from any given textual space, as readers focus on some elements over others and make decisions regarding their reading of a textual space, they create different texts. What readers ultimately engage with then are texts rather than textual spaces. A combination of metapoetry and multi-stability the poems I focus on in this study use the description of and meditation upon described objects as a vehicle to posit views of poetry and poetics. While in a longer version of this study, I also examine formo, due to time constraints in my presentation this morning, I will focus on the first two poems. The vision of Valente's poetics that results from an analysis of these poems is an increasingly fragmentary one. But as I seek to demonstrate, the use of poetic supplements has the potential to reveal an underlying incompleteness even in representations that might at first glance appear to be complete and full. In the process, offering an opportunity to revisit and reframe how we view Valente's work as a whole. There are several different ways to look at and divide the structure of the poem entitled El Cantaro. While Andrew Dubicki attributes a concrete, almost calligram calligrammatic quality to the poem in which Clara Curvatura applies to the poem, the way a poem is printed as well as to the shape of the jug, Jose Antonio Yera proposes two different ways of dividing the poem. His framing and discussion of the structure of El Cantaro highlights the visible three-part structure of the poem while also recognizing the importance of its middle point. The three parts of the poem would be made up of groups of verses consisting of five, five, and four lines respectively, leaving us with a more visually balanced structure represented by two stanzas of the same length to which a set of verses is added, the first of which is offset visually and which deviates from the anaphoric El Cantaro Que structure used up to that point. If we follow Yerra's framing of Valente's poem as one employing a tripartite structure, a question that arises is how we understand the role or roles each part plays. While it seems clear that a certain parallelism can be traced between the first two sets of five verses in the poem, the third part would seem to represent a visible departure from the dynamic established by these first two parts. 
On their surface, the last four verses of the poem link the description of a physical object, a jug, and a view of poetry, presenting both as beautiful and controllable. El hondo cántaro declara curvatura, bella y servil, el cántaro y el canto. I would argue that these last verses could be seen as an embrague in the sense in which Itziar Lopez Gil uses the term in a recent study of Miguel Hernández's self-reflexive poetry. For this critic, a través de una identificación entre enunciado y enunciación, entre lo que el texto dice y lo que el texto hace, se consigue instaurar un embrague entre ambos niveles. The space an embrague like this occupies in a poem would seem to play an especially important part in the work it does, and these verses simultaneously internal and external position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the poem allows them to comment on the lines that precede them, employing a clearer emphasis on description, de, as opposed to action, que. Borriera, connections between what texts say and what they do can be found in El Cántaro, which according to this critic, es un poema performativo, que realiza lo que dice. One wonders in the case of this poem, though, whether it actually does what it says, or if it instead projects an image of what the poet would like the poem to be and do, as well as uh, whether, as Debicki claims, the poem envisions as an ideal things like the fusion of form and function, of aesthetic and practical value, or if it instead explores potential tensions and contradictions between form and state of purpose. The fact that these verses and their metapoetic content appear at the end of the poem, set apart visually, creates the potential of reading this last part of the poem as a supplement. As Jacques Derrida's discussion of this concept in Of Grammatology explains, as substitute, a supplement is not simply added to the positivity of a presence. It produces no relief. Its place is assigned in the structure by the mark of an emptiness. His characterization of the supplement as an adjunct seems especially fitting in the case of the last verses of El Cantaro. This poem would seem to offer first-hand evidence of the danger that Derrida attributes to the supplement. The threat in this case is to the sense of unity readers might otherwise attribute to this poem and to the centrality of explicitly metapoetic content. This effort to drive home a point by way of a supplement ends up pointing out, in contract to Guerra's characterization of El Cantaro as a performative poem, that the rest of the poem might not be doing what the supplement says it is doing. If we move beyond the visual invitation to frame our reading of El Cantaro with its three stanzas as anchors, though, the text becomes potentially even more precarious. The poem's central two verses, Hueco de contener se quebraría inánime, simultaneously reinforce the reference at the beginning of the poem's second stanza to El Cantaro que existe conteniendo and suggest a potential crack or fissure in the poem object we have been examining up to this point. If it turned out that the ob object poem were ultimately not containing what we thought it did, the poem would break apart, as it itself tells us. If El Cantaro ends with a metapoetic element that appears in its last verse and its title signals a focus on a physical object, the title of El Signo, published six years later, does not mention the object the poem will describe and signals directly that it will include a metadiscursive dimension. The poem's two stanzas, made up of 11 and 7 verses respectively, take as their focus un cuenco de barro cosido al sol, and each begins with a prepositional phrase that focuses readers' gaze, gazes on this object, en este objeto breve, and aquí, en este objeto. If we were to search for an axis of balance and proportion in El Signo, in El Signo as the poem's second stanza claims that observers who look at this object do, it is not clear where it might be found or if there would even be one, in part because an initial glance at the poem's two stanzas reveals a significant imbalance between the two. To the presence of elements that also appeared in El Cantaro, like the focus on a clay container, the material from which it was created, and the work of its creator, the first stanza of El Signo adds a metadiscursive reference in the form of the term signo in its fifth verse. This word is part of an extended appositive that describes the object of the poem's third verse, un cuenco de barro cocido al sol, and functions as, functions as an aside of sorts. These verses present the cuenco as an object and site where a series of transformations take place. Donde la duración de la materia anónima se hace señal o signo, la sucesión compacta, frágil forma, 
tiempo o supervivencia. It is this object's continued existence that becomes a señal or signo, while compact succession becomes, a fra becomes fragile form, time, or survival. Continued existence, presence, and duration thus represent a common thread, and all of these things maintain the poem and the object it describes as an object of transitive attention. To flesh out a clearer picture of the relationship between these four verses and the rest of the stanza, we will imagine what the first verse of El Signo would look like without this extended description of the Cuenco de Barro Cosido al Sol. En este objeto breve a que dio forma el hombre, un cuenco de barro cosido al sol, se extiende la mirada, lentamente rodea la delgadez de la invención, lo que puso la mano en esta poca tierra, tosca y viva. The resulting stanza would consist of seven verses that offer a clear picture of the relationship between the object and the gaze that explores it. This act of looking, se extiende la mirada, would occupy the spatial center of this imagined stanza and end up being its focus. The outcome of this thought experiment would also yield a more balanced relationship between the two stanzas in the poem. A close look at the two versions of this first stanza, both the original one and the hypothetical one I have proposed, reveals an underlying supplemental logic at work in the poem, which at least from a visual standpoint, ends up unbalancing it. A detail that stands out in this case is the fact that this poetic supplement, made up of four verses, as was also the case in El Cantaro, appears in the middle of a stanza without any indentation. The responsibility of identifying these verses as a potential opportunity to switch aspects would thus fall on readers. The text generated by these two different ways of seeing this first stanza of El Signo, either including or excluding verses four through seven, yield two very different alternatives. Simultaneously, a poem with two stanzas of different lengths and a more explicit metapoetic dimension and a poem with two stanzas of equal length but no explicit metapoetic content, a signal creates space for readers to reflect on the fact that, as was also the case in El, in El Cantaro, the explicitly metapoetic content in a signal ends up unbalancing the poem in a formal and visual sense by virtue of belonging to a supplement. My readings of these poems have sought to lay the groundwork for arguing that assertions like W.J.T. Mitchell's claim that the duck rabbit is not just a puzzle that emerges against a background of stable, ordinary visual experience, could and should also apply to how we see Valente's poetry in general. Whether we look at other, the other poems included in Poemas al Lázaro or La Memoria y los Signos, or those included in earlier collections like Amodo de Esperanza, upon further examination, texts that appear to be balanced and self-sufficient might end up being more unstable than they seem at first glance. If, as Batimo claims, the 20th century is the century of poetics, an engagement with José Ángel Valente's container poems reveals that multi-stable poetics play a valuable role in this pro proliferation of poetics with all that this entails for both his work and that of other poets. Whether in the form of a cantaro or cuenco, these poemas poetica show how the strategic use of supplements creates opportunities for readers to engage with these texts as multi-stable poems that ultimately encourage readers to inter interrogate the assumptions we bring with us to our encounters with poetry. Thank you. Wow. Well, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Again, for those of us um, who may have joined uh, a little bit later, I want to uh, just uh, mention again, that we're going to uh, reserve all questions for the end of the session. So please do feel free to type them on the chat at any time. And please write the name of the person to whom you're addressing such question. And uh, we, we promise that we'll try to cover those, uh, as many of those as we can before the session ends at 11 sharp. Well, now we are going to um, enjoy the presentation by Dr. Maria Cristina Feli. And um, she is an assistant professor of Spanish at Penn State Berks. Her research spe specialties are contemporary poetry in Spain, literary translation, and Spanish for healthcare. She has published several articles in these areas, as well as poetry translations. In addition to literature, 
she often carries out volunteer translation projects, often in collaboration with her students. Recently, she has taught courses such as Hispanic arts and health, translation, interpreting, medical Spanish, and others, while serving as the chair of the Spanish program at Penn State Berks. Maria, take it away. Thanks so much, Samia. Um, I'm starting my timer right now so I can uh, keep track of those 20 minutes. Um, hi, everyone. So the um, this panel kind of has two more academic uh, presentations on either side. And in the middle, I will be doing um, a bilingual poetry reading for you. Um, so what I'm planning to do is to give kind of a brief introduction um, to my poet. And then um, I chose four short poems, um, and I'll be reading uh, both versions, uh, the original Spanish and my English translation. Um, and um, I guess I'll get started. So hopefully it'll be a, a bit of a different experience for you. Um, okay, so Antonio Colinas, uh, born in 1946 in La Bañeza, Leon, Spain, uh, has earned many literary prizes uh, during his very long career, including the National Prize for Literature in 1982, uh, and more recently, the Reina Sofia Prize for Ibero-American Poetry in 2016. Um, he's published nearly 20 uh, indi individual books of poetry, um, many anthologies, um, lots of essays and, and articles, uh, two novels, there should be a third um, any day now. Well, actually, I don't know when it's coming, but eventually. Um, and uh, many translated volumes, um, mostly from Italian into Spanish, uh, since he started uh, publishing in the 1960s. His body of work is united in the idea <clears throat> that writing verse is a, a vital fluid act that's interwoven uh, with human life and all of its facets. Many of his poems contain a sense of movement uh, and life that is symbolized with water. Um, and we'll see today, or as we will see today, in four poems from different uh, decades um, throughout his career. These poems come from books published uh, respectively in 1969, 1975, 1980, and 2014. Water, which is most often a symbol of life and vital flow for Colinas, in these poems plays a few different roles. Um, and since this is a bilingual reading, I won't be exactly explaining those roles, but I hope um, you'll think about them as I'm reading. So first, um, we'll see water as a springtime rain, um, then we'll see it in two different lakes and last at the seashore. So when I translate uh, Colinas' poems, um, which I've been doing for quite a while now, um, I try to recreate his poetic landscapes. Um, and I love that that Paul was talking about um, the the imagery, right? Kind of the, the concreteness of, of the things that we're seeing um, in poetic verse, um, because that's what I try to capture when I translate uh, Colinas' poetry um, into English, right? Is trying to recreate those, those visual poetic landscapes um, to give the reader um, an image um, of what the original text is, is trying to show, right? So trying to, to create kind of a, a reflection of that poetic landscape uh, in the English translation. So um, as I'm reading these, I ask that you simply listen um, and kind of imagine, right? Just let your, let your imagination flow with, with the verses. Um, as I read first the original poem in Spanish and then the translation. The first poem is called uh, Luces de Primavera de Antonio Colinas, del libro Preludios a una Noche Total um, from 1969. And this was one of his uh, first two published volumes that it, he had two books that appeared in 1969. Um, this was one of them. So Luces de Primavera. So appropriate with the, the early spring we're having. So, a veces se abre el cielo plomizo y cae un rayo de sol sobre esta tierra húmeda, vaporosa. Cae un rayo de sol sobre el almendro grácil. Cae una flecha de oro sobre las aguas muertas. Cae una luz purísima sobre el césped oscuro. A veces se abre el cielo y deja de sonar la lluvia entre los álamos, en los tejados viejos, 
hay un hálito fresco en las calles vacías. Un pájaro se atreve a cantar, temeroso. Se rascan las cortinas cenicientas del cielo y un rayo puro llene la atmósfera invernal. Entonces, la, en la tierra, en los cambios hondos de la sangre, rebrota una fiebre, un ardor, y pensamos gozosos que hay otra primavera, ciñendo nuestros cuerpos con sus brazos de luz. And the translation, Lights of Spring, from Preludes to a Total Night, 1969. Sometimes the leaden sky opens and down falls a ray of sunlight onto this damp, misty earth. A ray of sunlight falls onto the slender almond tree. A golden arrow falls onto the dead waters. A pure, pure light falls over the dark grass. Sometimes the sky opens and the rain stops, stops sounding among the poplars on the old tiled roofs. There's a fresh breeze in the empty streets. A bird dares to sing, fearful. The ashen curtains of the sky are torn apart and a pure beam cuts through the wintry atmosphere. Then in the earth, in the deep courses of blood, reappears a fever, a burning, and we think, joyful, that there is another springtime encircling our bodies with its arms of light. I think for all of us, springtime is coming a bit early this year, but we might as well enjoy it, right? <laughs> Okay, the second poem is one of his shortest poems. Um, it's called Lago de Trastimeno from 1975 from his most, or I would say his, his best known book called Sepulcro en Tarquinia. Um, some of you, if you know Antonio's work, um, you may be familiar with his long poem, Sepulcro en Tarquinia, which comes from this same book um, that he published in 1975 um, after he was living in Italy, um, in Milan and Bergamo for about four years. All right, so Lago de Trasimeno de Antonio Colinas. Solo brillaste para mí un instante en la putrida tarde de tormenta. Me pareciste un relámpago verde sobre el mojado y tenebroso bosque de olivos. Fría esmeralda bajo luz muy negra. That's it. It's just a little tiny, tiny, tiny poem. Okay, so Lake Trasimeno from Sepulchre in Tarquinia. You shone for me only a moment in the putrid stormy afternoon. To me, you looked like a green flash of lightning above the damp and somber forest of olive trees, cold emerald under very black light. I love that one. It's like a tiny, a tiny visual gem. The next poem um, is untitled. It's simply a uh, poem number one from his um, short book um, called En lo Oscuro from 1980. All right, and this one also has um, kind of lake imagery. Um, it also has, uh, for me, very interesting um, images of movement. Arrastrado por un gran ben vendaval de estrellas, regresaba el barco aquella noche bajo la luna nueva y parecía como si el silencio, la extensión de las aguas, sellaran nuestros labios, nos hicieran extraños y presentes el uno para el otro. Yo extraviado en la luz de la noche de estío, sin saber que tú entonces me soñabas mirándome en la luz de la luna. And in English, poem one from In the Dark, 1980. Drawn by a strong gale of stars, the boat was returning that night under a new moon, and it seemed as if the silence, the vastness of the waters, sealed our lips, made us strange and present to each other. I, lost in the light of the summer night, without knowing that you were dreaming of me then, gazing at me in the light of the moon. I think that's our preview for, for summertime. 
And the last poem is much more recent than all the others. Um, this last one is from 2014. Um, in that year, he published um, a tiny, tiny little book of 14 poems called Catorce Retratos de Mujer, 14, 14 Portraits of Woman, um, which, uh, in which each poem um, represents uh, either a different specific woman or in the case of this one, um, a woman who is um, unnamed. Okay, so uh, these are also unnamed and this is uh, poem four, poem number four from Catorce Retratos de Mujer de Antonio Colinas um, del año 2014. All right. Te vi brotando de una noche negra y me parecía que llevabas en las manos algo que semejaban flores rojas. Mas no, no eran flores, sino algo parecido a una herida que sangraba. Una historia muy tuya y muy secreta que le ibas mostrando por la orilla del mar, a las algas y a las húmedas sombras. Sí, en realidad era un racimo de sangre, no de rosas lo que estrechabas con tus brazos blancos, lo que cercabas con tus manos blancas. And in English, poem four from 14 Portraits of Woman, 2014. I saw you blooming from a black night, and it seemed to me that you carried in your hands something that looked like red flowers. But no, it wasn't flowers, but something like a wound that was bleeding, a story very much yours and very secret that you were showing by the seashore to the seaweed and to the damp shadows. Yes, it was actually a cluster of blood, not roses, that you held tightly in your white arms, that you surrounded with your white hands. All right, and that was the last of the four poems. Um, so with that, that water imagery, um, the imagery of elements that flow, you know, whether it's the, the water, the wind, um, even the, the blood, um, what Antonio uh, does in, in a lot of his poems, many, many of which um, have that, that natural imagery, that imagery of, of water um, and flowing elements, um, he kind of brings them forward as, as elements that, that connect um, the pieces of the universe, I would say, right? That that connect um, humanity with with the things that that humans create, but also with with nature, with the the larger universe, right? So all, all of these 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 images of what he sometimes calls, um, you know, lifeblood, kind of the the flowing elements that that go through everything, right? Through humans, through animals. Um, through through nature and also the things that we create, it, it connects us all. And um, you know, kind of, this is his his vision of the universe, right? Being all inter interconnected with these flowing elements. So um, I think I was a little under time. So bonus. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I appreciate your attention, and I, I hope that some of these images um, kind of lit up your mind. Um, with some uh, some beauty from Colinas's poems this morning. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I, you know, um, sometimes um, a virtual meet meeting is better than nothing, but I really wish you had had the possibility of seeing the reaction of your audience. Mm. Because as I was listening to you, I wanted to just just respond to what you were reading and sharing. And, um, you know, I know you were just looking at a screen, but I, I, I do think that uh, other people in the audience are feeling the way I do. I, I just was fascinated by, it, uh, by the, the imagery in the poetry, as well as the translation, which is quite a challenge. And maybe we'll ask some questions about that later. <laughs> Thank you but, so much, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Well, and now we are going to listen to our own, although she left us not too long ago. 
<laughs> We're now going to listen to Dr. Rhonda Dal Buchanan. She's a translator and professor emerita of Spanish at the University of Louisville, where she taught classes of Latin American literature and directed the Latin American and Latino Studies program until she retired in July of 2022. During her career, she received the Trustees Award and all three of the University of Louisville's Distinguished Professor Awards for teaching, service to the community, and outstanding scholarship, research, and creative activity. She has published numerous studies on the works of Latin American writers, especially Argentine authors such as Tununa Mercado, Mempo Giardinelli, Ana Maria Schwa, and Perla Suez, and the Mexican author Alberto Ruiz Sanchez. She has also published translations of works by these same authors and is the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship for her translation of the novel Los Jardines Secretos de Mogador, Voces de Tierra by Ruiz Sanchez. Her current translation project is a memoir by the Spanish poet Fernando Opere, En el Nombre del Padre, Crónica de la España de Franco a la América de Trump. She will give a bilingual reading with Dr. Opere for the Hispanic keynote presentation of the Louisville Conference on Friday, February 24th at 3.15 in Ekstrom Libraries Bingham Poetry Room. So don't miss it. All right, Rhonda, can't wait to hear your presentation. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Sami. Y gracias a todos que están aquí presentes, especialmente a Tununa Mercado y sus hijos, Oliverio en México y, y Magdalena en Buenos Aires con su madre y mi editora Rosemary Salum en Houston. Así que eh, es, este es un placer para mí participar en el Louisville Conference, especialmente este año en el cual celebramos el aniversario de 40 años del Congreso. Como dijo eh, Samia, me jubilé en julio de 2022, después de 40 años como profesora de español en la Universidad de Louisville, y por lo tanto he participado en este congreso desde los primeros años. Hoy quisiera compartir con ustedes unas reflexiones sobre la obra de la escritora cordobesa Tununa Mercado. Comencé escribiendo estudios críticos sobre su obra hace muchos años y eventualmente ella me invitó a traducir su libro Canon de Alcoba. La traducción salió en enero de 2022 como Chamber Canon y hoy quisiera hablarles sobre su narrativa en términos generales y el proceso de traducirla. He titulado esta ponencia Las cajas chinas de la memoria en la obra de Tununa Mercado porque la autora misma usa la metáfora de la caja convocante de la escritura para hablar de su obra y a reflejar sobre la manera en que llegué a conocer a Tununa, me di cuenta de que es una larga historia de cajas chinas, de amistades y de amor a la literatura argentina. Mi fascinación con la literatura argentina comenzó en 1978, mientras estudiaba para el doctorado en la Universidad de Colorado y tomé una clase sobre literatura argentina contemporánea con Beatriz Guido, quien fue una profesora eh, visitante ese año. En algún momento, Beatriz eh, le, le dio mi dirección a Ana María Shua, una joven escritora que acababa de, de publicar su primer, sus primeros libros. Pasaron unos años y un día recibí por correo su primera novela, Soy Paciente, y su primera colección de cuentos, Los Días, días de Pesca. 
Y cuando hice mi primera visita a la Argentina en 1987, conocí personalmente a Ana María Shua y comencé a escribir estudios sobre su obra y años después a traducirla. Fue Ana María quien me recomendó que leyera la obra de Tununa Mercado. Y en mi próximo viaje a Buenos Aires, en 1990, conocí a Tununa y a su esposo Noé Gitrick. En otro viaje, en 1996, cuando le dije a Tununa que me habían invitado a dar una presentación en la Universidad Nacional de Córdoba, ella me puso en contacto con una amiga suya la escritora cordobesa Perla Suez, y fue el, el inicio de otra larga amistad. Eh, y escribí estudios críticos sobre su trilogía de Entre Ríos, y luego Perla me invitó a traducir sus novelas. En 1998, Tununa, Perla y yo nos reunimos en Córdoba para presentar en la Feria Internacional del Libro la tercera edición de En Estado de Memoria, publicada por Alción Editora. En mi presentación de este libro, mencioné que Tununa se refiere a su proceso creativo como la caja convocante de la escritura. Ella lo explica así. La caja es mi mundo interior, es la vida en el interior de mi casa, es un espacio circunscrito a la escritura, también es el lugar de la memoria. Todo lo que escribo tiene esa relación con esa búsqueda melancólica de la memoria. Y si la memoria es una escritura de la muerte, mi intento es sobreponerme a esa melancolía. Toda mi escritura es entonces trasponer esa pérdida, recuperando esas zonas entre la memoria y los recuerdos. La estructura de En Estado de Memoria es de hecho un juego de cajas chinas, ya que los textos, aunque independientes en sí, se entrelazan entre ellos, encerrándose en espacios confinados cada vez más íntimos. Casas, habitaciones, contenedores, baúles, ataúdes y el recinto más privado de todos, el cuerpo. De la misma manera, el libro, en estado de memoria, se relaciona con otras obras suyas como vasos comunicantes unidos por una temática que gira en torno a la memoria y el deseo y una escritura que sobrepasa los márgenes sin cerrarse o culminar definitivamente. Por ejemplo, su libro autobiográfico, La Madriguera, surgió de unos fragmentos de En Estado de Memoria, en los cuales la autora retoma los pasos de su infancia en busca de algo perdido que solo se recupera a través de los recuerdos. Escarbando en las madrigueras de la memoria, Tununa resucita en el texto Embajada imágenes de su padre caminando por las calles de Córdoba y reconstruye en el texto Casas los ámbitos privados de la casa de su infancia que aparecerán luego en la novela La Madriguera. En otro texto de En Estado de Memoria, titulado Visita Guiada, Tununa relata un momento traumático de la niñez de Pedro, un refugiado español, amigo suyo, con quien ella trabajaba durante los años del exilio en México. Esa historia de encuentros y desencuentros que Pedro compartió con Tununa le sirvió como la base para su novela Yo nunca te prometí la eternidad. En el texto Fenomenología, también de En Estado de Memoria, eh, Tununa se refiere al origen de su, texto, su libro anterior, Canon de Alcoba. Dice, durante el exilio escribí textos eróticos, pero no porque buscara escribirlos. Ellos se ponían sobre el papel y se encadenaban con bastante sutura, sin yo convocarlos. En una entrevista con Gabriela Mora, 
La autora reflexiona sobre la relación paradójica entre Eros y Tánatos en Canon de Alcoba, diciendo, no sé por qué me metí en esa cinta envolvente y recursiva del amor, pero creo que debe haber sido para defenderme de la muerte durante los años del terror militar. De todos los libros que ha publicado Pucluna, los textos de Canon de Alcoba han gozado de más renombre y han aparecido en más antologías y más revistas literarias. Escrito en México y publicado en Buenos Aires en 1988, un año después de su retorno definitivo a la Argentina, Canon de Alcoba recibió mucha atención crítica cuando ganó el premio Boris Bian un galardón literario establecido durante la dictadura para reconocer una obra que representaba una ruptura con el discurso cultural oficial. Para Tununa, Eros y escritura son inseparables porque el deseo es lo que da forma al texto, como ella explica en su ensayo Pensar una erótica. Dice... Nunca he dejado de escribir y el máximo erotismo es precisamente escribir o, si se prefiere, solamente pensar o aún más contemplar. Fue su tratamiento audaz e innovador del erotismo que captó la atención de los miembros del jurado del premio Boris Bian, quienes nombra nombraron Canon de Alcoba, el mejor libro argentino publicado en 1988. Y ahora, más de 30 años después, el libro sigue fascinando a sus lectores con su, su ruptura con los cánones de la literatura erótica convencional. En Canon de Alcoba, Tununa detiene la mirada y su oído en el cuerpo, celebrando en los textos dedicados a Eros el impulso sensual, sexual del acto de escribir y el poder de la palabra para conjurar el placer. La obra consiste de 29 textos organizados en siete secciones de diversos temas, no todos eróticos, con títulos como espejismos, sueños, realidades, eros y antieros. Canon de Alcoba es tanto una celebración de la naturaleza polimorfa de, del erotismo como lo es una exploración del carácter provocador y transgresivo del lenguaje, la imaginación y la literatura misma. Muchos años después de presentar ponencias y publicar estudios críticos sobre Canon de Alcoba, Tuluna me invitó a traducir el libro al inglés. Acepté con mucho entusiasmo, sin imaginarme la gran aventura y el gran desafío que me esperaban al tratar de captar en inglés la prosa tan ingeniosa y original de Tuluna. Fue un desafío preservar el ritmo de sus frases tan intrincadas con cláusulas intercaladas uno dentro de otra, creando una sintaxis de cajas chinas. Otro reto fue encontrar las palabras exactas en inglés que se equiparan a su vocabulario de tan amplia gama. Al traducir a Tununa, a veces me pareció que el inglés no podía compararse con el castellano, que el español era mucho más expresivo que el parco inglés. Hubo tantas dudas que pensé, tal vez sea la traductora quien no le llega a la suela del zapato a Tununa, una verdadera maga lingüística. Afortunadamente, persistí en mis esfuerzos por traducir a Tununa y las dudas se convirtieron en alegrías y si me, me permiten, hasta un estado de éxtasis. ¿Y por qué no? En su ensayo, Las escritoras y el tema del sexo, Tununa reflexiona sobre la relación entre el erotismo y la escritura de la siguiente manera. He pensado que la escritura y el erotismo se alimentan de una misma energía libidinal, que ese continuo 
entre cuerpo y escritura, entre goce del cuerpo y goce de la palabra escrita, es una fusión, combustión. La escritura sería, pues, para mí, un modelo de sexualidad. Propongo que la tra traducción es también un modelo de sexualidad, un acto íntimo entre goce del cuerpo y goce de la palabra traducida para parafrasear a tu luna. Yo diría también que la traducción es un acto erótico cargado con deseo por la intimidad. Como traductora, mi mirada es una de deseo, como la voyeur, que motivado por un anhelo prohibido de penetrar al otro desde una distancia cómoda. Deseo acercarme a la autora y cortar la distancia que separa una cultura de otra y una lengua de otra. Después de todo, ¿qué es lo que los tra traductores tratamos de hacer cuando tenemos entre las manos un texto virgen? ¿No es cierto que tratamos de meternos bajo la piel de nuestros autores para vivir a través del otro ese maravilloso instante de creación cuando las palabras toman su forma inicial y culminan en un diseño único? ¿No es cierto? que intentamos desentrañar y captar en nuestras propias palabras la visión que nuestros autores han acariciado en la imaginación, en los sueños, en sus cuerpos durante años, tal vez durante toda la vida. Siempre atesoraré los recuerdos de mi última visita a Buenos Aires en septiembre de 2019. AC, antes de COVID, cuando tuve la dicha de pasar una semana de mi último sabático trabajando con Tununa en el borrador de Chamber Cannon. Trabajamos durante horas en la mesa de su comedor y mientras yo leía la traducción al inglés, ella me seguía en el original. De vez en cuando nos deteníamos en una frase u otra y con su experiencia como traductora del francés al español y su excelente dominio del inglés, pudimos considerar opciones que mejoraron la traducción. Otras veces nos reíamos de algo insólito o perverso que Tununa había inventado hacía tantos años, como por ejemplo el gran giro, el giro inesperado del texto de la sección Espejismos, en el cual un hombre sentado en un carro del metro parece exponer el pene, obviamente el suyo, a los pasajeros, quienes lo observan atónitos. Al bajarse en la estación Cuatebok, la narradora le informa al lector que no todo es como aparenta ser. Les leeré la última frase del texto en inglés. When the metro arrived at Cuauhtémoc without anyone disturbing the bond that had been established, the man raised the pair that he had held between his fingers up to his nose and sniffed it exposing nothing more than the dimple from which its stem once protruded, then stuck it in the pocket of his pants and hurried off the subway car into the station. Como resultado de esa hermosa colaboración, la editorial Literal, Literal Publishing, mi maravillosa editora Rosemary Saloon, publicó en enero de 2022 Chamber Cannon, apropiadamente con un comentario en la contratapa eh, de Ana María Shua, la artífice de mi larga amistad con Tununa Mercado. Me alegro tanto que con esta traducción de Canon de Alcoba, Tununa pueda ganar nuevos seguidores entre los lectores que no pueden leer su obra en el idioma original. Entre los nuevos aficionados que ya han leído el libro está mi amiga Ellen Weiner, una traductora de ruso 
al inglés. Cuando le mencioné que iba a dar esta ponencia sobre la obra de Tununa partiendo de la metáfora de las cajas chinas, él se emocionó mucho y, y me dijo en inglés, ah, las cajas chinas son como una trochka, esas muñecas rusas que se recogen una dentro de la otra. Entonces, nuestra conversación se puso muy animada mientras hablamos de cómo la traducción es un juego de cajas chinas o de muñecas rusas. El proceso comienza con un borrador, la muñeca más grande, o sea, la versión que capta los significados superficiales del texto, los más obvios o aparentes. Entonces, abrimos la próxima muñeca y descubrimos detalles que no vimos al primer, en el primer paso y la traducción llega a ser más refinada. Abrimos otra muñeca aún más pequeña mientras eh, encontramos alusiones culturales y los significados de metáforas que se nos escaparon antes. Seguimos escarbando, tachando, revisando y puliendo el texto y al contrario de la caja de Pandora, al abrir cada nueva caja, se revela otro descubrimiento que da rienda suelta a otro hallazgo más. Todo lo cual nos lleva a momentos de felicidad plena. Finalmente, llegamos a la última muñeca, la última caja, la más pequeña de todas, escondida muy dentro de las otras. Y si tenemos suerte, descubrimos no solamente la esencia del texto, sino una revelación sobre nuestro propio ser. Porque el lenguaje nativo o extranjero es algo muy íntimo que reside en nosotros, se recoge en el corazón, es parte de nuestro cuerpo, de nuestra memoria, de nuestra alma. Para mí ha sido un privilegio y un honor traducir este libro de Tununa Mercado y escribir estudios so sobre sus obras y compartirlas en mis clases con mis alumnos. Ahora, por mi jubilación en julio de 2022, tuve que empacar en muchas cajas lo que había acumulado durante 40 años en la Universidad de Louisville y me he vuelto más obsesionada con los recuerdos que Tununa la memoriosa. Quisiera terminar hoy expresando mi profunda gratitud por la larga amistad con Tununa y su querido esposo Noé Gitrick un regalo que atesoraré para siempre. Gracias. Wow. Amazing. Gracias, Ronda. Well, I initially had given instructions to type the questions in the chat. But for those of you who did not get a chance to do so, because you probably uh, joined uh, a bit later, why don't we, uh, I feel there are some hands raised, uh, and some, someone may have a question. So I will allow uh, maybe for a person to raise your hand if you're interested in asking a question. And um, we will open the floor to questions now. All right, so I don't see any questions on the chat. Um, um, see? This is, yeah, this is Tomas Edison. I cannot figure out how to raise my hand, but <laughs> uh, I do have a question. Well, first a comment, I think the presentations were wonderful. And I'm really taken with Maria Cristina's presentation because as she was reading her poems, I was looking in my yard seeing the daffodils that were blooming. <laughs> now, I have a question for you, Maria Cristina. Um, mm -hmm. When you, what do you plan to do with these translations of the poem? And the second, or the poems, and the second question is, have you worked at all with the author in these translations? Has he seen them? Did you work collaboratively? That's my second question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for your questions. I, I appreciate that you were you were looking out at the the springtime while we were reading, you know, these these poems that talk so much about those elements of spring. Um, yes, so I have been working with Antonio Colinas. I first met him, um, or we've been in touch since about 2007. Wow, that's a long time. <laughs> like, is it really 2023? So yeah, I've I've known him. Um, in person since 2008. That was when I first met him. Um, we've been working together and we've been in touch um, all these years. Um, and it's been kind of a long process because I met him right after I graduated from my my undergraduate degree. Um, and then I went to do a master's and a PhD and then, you know, a job and, you know, working towards tenure. And so all that time I have been translating. I've been um, writing um, uh, articles on his work, um, researching him, keeping in touch. Um, he has seen most of the translations that I've done, except maybe some of the newer ones. Um, and I do hope that one day it will become um, a finished manuscript. I do have a, a publisher in mind who is open to looking at only a finished manuscript. Um, so I'm hoping that um, once my uh, tenure portfolio is turned in next <laughs> next year, <laughs> um, I can finally get to that. Um, because since then, it's been it's been mostly um, writing articles. But um, what I really want to do um, is to get um, a selected poem anthology out there of his works. And of course, it's what it's what he wants to. And he's been um, very supportive. Um, he you know answers questions uh, when I have them. Um, he's a really nice person to work with. Um, and of course, he's extremely prolific. Um, so I think to to start, you know, and uh, there are no anthologies yet of Colinas's work in English. There are in um, in Italian, um, German, and um, Korean, a few other languages. Um, there are only a few kind of scattered poems um, in English, a few that are mine, and a, a couple from from a few other people. But um, I do plan to get that uh, that anthology manuscript sent out as soon as humanly possible or as soon as academically possible because <laughs> we all know that we have to get those articles out um so that is the plan and thank you very much um for your question thank Gracias, you Maria. I wanted to follow up on that Gracias, um, does, mm -hmm. does antonio speak english does he have a good command of english so that that helps you out or do you have to kind of explain things in Spanish, because I know it helped me with Tununa that she speaks English, but Perlas West, my other author, doesn't. So I have to do everything with images and Googling and so forth. Sure. Yeah. And Tony has uh, he has a, a reading command of English, um, so he he can read it. He has translated a few, a very few um, poems from English into Spanish, um, oh. but he doesn't he doesn't really communicate in it. And so our, you know, our working relationship is all in Spanish and um, for things like, you know, letters and contracts and permissions, um, I usually translate those for him just so he has a good idea of, um, you know, what I'm asking him for. I just wondered cases. if he was able to read what you translate and say, well, not exactly. This I was not exactly what I had in mind and maybe offer something else. But when, when uh, does, mm, does on he occasion, um, he he's actually very kind of, you know, like he's very um giving in the way that he he I think he trusts me <laughs> after you know we we've been working together for a really long time um and um I don't think he's ever questioned a translation decision that mm -hmm. I made um but I do ask him you know if if I'm ever in, in doubt about something I I do tend to ask him um questions in those cases um to clarify um but um for the most part yeah no he he can read the English translations um but Possibly not not to you know it, certainly not to the extent that a, a native speaker would would understand the English because his languages are, are principally Spanish and and Italian. Okay, gracias, Maria. Well, we have gracias. a question from the audience. Um, I'm going to read every every section of the question. There is some comments before. I want to thank everyone for these magnificent presentations. This question goes to Rhonda. Contrary to what your first impression was about Tununa's wonderful Spanish, your translation was just as beautiful. How can you achieve such beauty? And can you share an anecdote of what passage was the most difficult to translate? Well, I think 
I thank you so much, Rosemary, for being here and for your comment. You know, it's not hard to do a beautiful translation when the original is so gorgeous, you know, but she has, a, it, I think it, what I struggle with probably the most is that her prose is very Baroque and there's like all these clauses, cl clausulas, clauses embedded one inside the other. So to try to like unravel it, it was difficult. And and not all of the book, even though you would think so, Canon de Alcoba, you know, I, we, we went back and forth about what the, the, the title should be. Should we use the word bedroom? But really we decided on chamber because there's lots of different, that, that's evocative and much more, includes many more uh, spaces. But one of my problems was, you know, I would say, oh my God, that was so gorgeous on these erotic texts. Can I really say that in English? And so when I would do the first rough translation, it would be like, oh man, that is really in your face. Can I really do it this way? And so I, I was just refining it a lot. And um, so that text I read about the man with the pear, it's one of my favorites. The challenge there, and sometimes with other texts of hers, is there's a element of surprise at the very, very end. And you don't want to give it away with put it in the syntax by putting that surprise too soon. So you had mm -hmm. to leave it toward the end, you know, and you had to get build up the rhythm with it. And so that that's a little example. I, I could give you so many more, but there's not enough time. Gracias, Ronda. Um, I have a question, I, I guess, a so, sort of a comment and a question for Paul. Um, as you were mentioning, uh, a quote that you read was uh, that the poetry is a de es una declaración del autor sobre su concepción de la poesía. Um, and then you gave the imagery of clara curvatura. And you also mentioned El Hondo Cántaro. These are uh, not together, they are separate ideas. But I, I was thinking of the, um, the imagery of, is it a dog? Is it a rabbit? Um, <laughs> so it's kind of like the poetry is a painting here, right? And the reader seems to have to, the responsibility of determining what that, that meaning is. But, um, you were mentioning that there are two different alternatives in this type of uh, interpretation. Would you consider that there can be more than two alternatives in, in the interpretations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, I think I think one of the tensions around the idea of the multi-stable image is, is that question of whether they're mutually exclusive readings or if they could somehow both be present at the same time. And I think um, I think one, I would say that they you can have multiple readings at the same time and there can be more than two potentially either kind of one reading would be, yes, it's, it's a stable solid object or no, it's more fragmentary or is it potentially both at the same time? Or is it kind of somewhere in the middle? I think what you often see when you read what critics have said about Valente's work, though, is they um, they tend to kind of want to put it into one category or another. Um, right. And and they you what I read in there is kind of a sense of their assumptions about poetry getting kind of stamped onto that in terms of the the elements they they focus on and the ones they don't focus on. Your presentation triggered my imagination so much that uh, with the idea of El Hondo Cántaro, mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh my goodness, am I, am I actually, you know, uh, overthinking this? But the idea of El Hondo Cántaro to me made me think of two interpretations, but based on the same image. Not so much a duck or uh, a bunny, is it a bunny, is it a dog? It was more, wow, either the dog or the bunny have some depth within them because the ondo cantaro could also mean void. Is it a void mm -hmm. or is it plenty? 
because you can look at it as plenty of room to put mm -hmm. inside of it, or this cantaro, which is so deep, is so empty as well. So I, I, my imagination mm -hmm. was just flowing, and I was wondering, you know, the, what do you think about that view that I was having as you were expressing these thoughts? Yeah, so it sounds like what you're getting at is sort of uh, a variation of the idea of like the glass half full or the glass half empty, right? Like, is it is it emptiness or is it that potential of what it can contain? Or is it potentially both things at the right. same time? It's almost like looking at the gut of the duck or the rabbit, whichever you think it is. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. Thank you. I yeah, was especially you. interested, Paul, when you, you use the word container. I'll, I perked up your contenedor because mm -hmm. that, I see that relationship with what I just talked about with Tanuna's work. You know, one thing held inside the other. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really fascinating. I was wondering while you were reading um, if you've also translated these poems. I have not. Um, one interesting detail with that, though, is. Um, if you look at the that the anthologies of Valente's poetry, it's rare to see those three poems together. Um, and the ironically, the one um, anthology I'm aware of that has all three together is a translation into English. Oh. So the person who did this edition um, saw the value in putting these three poems together. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Spain, it's it's interesting you can. To a degree, you can read the um, where where the um, people creating anthologies are coming from aesthetically speaking. So there are poets who are potentially Valente. You can read him in different ways. If you're looking for more of kind of a traditional, conventional view of poetry, you can find poems that do that. If you're looking for things that are more openly fragmentary, you can find poems that do that. And so I think his poetry allows critics and and anthologos to. To kind of create the vision they want to create, um, but no. So I, I myself have been, haven't translated them, but um, but I think they would be an interesting case study for translation in terms of what you emphasize. If there are words with multiple meanings, which meanings you you I, you try to capture in English, and why, and visually, how do you put it together, and what reading are you creating through your translation? Thank you. I also had a question for both of you because I, I, I know you both translate poetry and I, do you also both translate prose sometimes? I have because, never translated prose, no. Well, I started with prose, but with this latest book of mine, which I put somewhere and now I can't find it, that I'm going to talk about on Friday in El Nombre del Padre by Fernando Pere. There are poems are in the book. So I have been doing more with poetry than I ever did before like never before except for some haikus and so i was wondering paul have you done both prose and poetry um so only in in a, in a more utilitarian sense so i've never Fiction. um yeah so typically when and typically when i translate it's it's for publications that require the whole text to be in english okay and then that way i'll do it or if we've had the opportunity to invite poets to our campus Mm -hmm. And we do like a bilingual poetry reading, but um, but primarily poetry and not prose. Well, speaking of poetry, then, it, I mean, do you have a certain method, both of you, that you use when you, uh, is it a little bit like the muñecas rusas where you're, you start out kind of rough and then you keep trying to refine it? Or do you have a particular method that works for you for translating poetry? Um, I would say, I, I of course, yeah, I think probably most people tend to start with, you know, more of like a literal kind of rough draft, and then you kind of refine it from there, see, you know, how, the, how it, you know, how it sounds in English, how it flows, um, you know, and kind of look at with, a, with each revision that you do, look for more of those little details, illusions, metaphors, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, things that, that you can maybe try to, to recreate or reflect. Um, but I tend to focus mm -hmm. mostly on the imagery, mm -hmm. um, Right. And maybe not not quite so much on maybe the um, I don't know the elements that that you hear, but more the elements that that you tend to see. Which is why I loved both of your your presentations because you're you're focusing so much on on the imagery, like you know, on the things that when when you're reading a text, you can almost re, uh, kind of reach out and and touch 
um, which is how I've always kind of um, seen poems more as, as visual objects or, or visual landscapes. This is actually a great segue to a question I had. Um, the, the, I, I'm thinking the translation of prose allows for more flexibility in a sense, but when you are translating a, a poem which is so short, Mm -hmm. as the one you read for us by Colinas. It would seem that translating a, po a, a poem that short is easy. Would you agree with that? Because I, it would seem more challenging. What do you sacrifice first? Because we're trying to recreate for the reader the same emotions that they have in the, in the first language. So how do you achieve that in the target language? Would you sacrifice meaning before rhyme? Um, you know, la sonoridad del poema. How do you, all of you, if, if you can uh, conceive a response, what, what would you think is the, the one, if you cannot achieve a combination of the sound and the metrics and the meaning, what goes first? What, what? Does one sacrifice? I wonder. Uh, luckily for me, Colinas doesn't tend to rhyme. <laughs> um, of course, he he does have um, he does have you know a certain a certain rhythm and flow. Um, but I think that you know since Spanish and English tend to have kind of different cadences, um, I don't focus on that so much because I don't. I usually it can't. It's not something that can really be recreated in English. Um, and so I I tend to prioritize the imagery. You know, try to look for that kind of. Uh, visual reflection um, in English. So sort of what I think is if I read the original and see, you know, and with my mind's eye, see kind of the same thing as I do when I read the English version, that's kind of what I'm going for. Okay, I see. And, and I would say with Tununa's work is very, very poetic prose. So it, it comes, it, it, I think there's a, a, a lot of poetry in, in, in her, her prose. I, I, when I first started translating many, many years ago is with Ana Maria Shua and she invited me to translate her mic, micro relatos. Uh, and I did that an anthology called Quick Fix. And, you know, I was just starting translating and I thought, well, this will be easy piece of cake, you know, pan comido because, you know, they're so <laughs> short, they're so short. Well, that, that was completely false. I mean, that was just not true. It, they were a challenge because it was just like the hermano de poesia, the micro Lato says Julio Cortazar, and and you had to get that rhythm and that and and that concise mm -hmm. language, the economy of expression, and then that surprise yes. thing that she always has. So, uh, and I had the same problem or or challenge when I did uh, this book with um and Los, the Secret Gardens of Mogador has a whole chapter of haikus and try to do haikus that 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 was a real challenge so but it was fun too i really enjoyed it uh, mm -hmm. and i collaborated with both authors they both speak english so that that helped me a lot good yeah and i think for me um a little bit like what maria said in terms of trying to Get, get sort of a visual or a sense of what the original poem is doing and then seeing if the translation captures a similar sort of effect. I think what I try to do is um, identify what what to me is is sort of the essence of what the poem is doing. And then I try to create a, a similar impact in English. And I think in some cases, for me, form plays a more important role and in other cases, a less important role. Like there's one, yes. there's another poet, Oscar Curieses, who wrote a poem, it's like an acrostic sort of poem, mm -hmm. where um, the first letters of each verse, it spells out Antonio Machado wow. in there. And so when I translated that poem, I had to be very strategic because I thought I can't translate this poem and not create that same effect. That wouldn't be doing justice to what his poem is doing. But then it, I had to be extremely creative where like if you would start out a verse with antes de, mm -hmm. like I can't start it out with before. No. So what do I do instead? And I had to make certain concessions with other aspects of the poem because I decided that that was one element I had to keep. But I, I sort of knew going in that I couldn't keep everything. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I agree. There are, you know, there are a lot of theories of how to translate poetry. Um, but I think that the one that I like the most um, is that, you know, there's just kind of this 
this whole spectrum of, of possibilities. And you really have to be flexible, not just with each poem, but like with each word that you're looking at, right? Like you might have a different method for one word and then a different method for translating the next word, right? And just like Paul said, if in a, you know, in a specific poem, you have one aspect of it, like your Antonio Machado in the first lines, which I agree is, is extremely important and you had to keep, and I can't imagine how long it took you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so for each poem, you know, what is the most important? And um, within Colinas's poetry, for me, usually it's the visual, like what, what are we seeing here and how do I recreate that? But sometimes there, there are different things you need to do with, with a word or a verse, or a stanza, um, and it just really depends on the poem and and what you want to do with it. Paul, will be ready for an email from me asking for that across. Yes, the I was thinking this. Oh, okay. I want to see what you did, <laughs> how you did that. <laughs> what a challenge! Yeah, I, yeah, I, we I have... went. I, I went with awaiting. Was the was the word I used for antes de? Wow. Uh, because he ended up using it, I think, for every every a in the poem. Mm. in the in the titles but yeah i can i can dig that up perfect <laughs> so jana has a question for all of you what are the most important skill translators should have i would say patience number one <laughs> yeah <laughs> patience because i think we, we translators have to refer to us now as long haulers i was calling us a long hauler before covid antes de covid because you take for, I mean, this book with Tununa, I started translating it a long, long time ago and knocking on doors to find uh, publishers. And the process of translating itself evolved and was, uh, took. A, I had many, many, many different versions. And after working with Tununa, I had a different version. And then finally, this La Santa Rosemary Saloon agreed to to um, publish the book. And it, it, so sometimes it can take years before we see a project come to fruition where it's out in the hands of the public. For sure. And kind of to connect with that patience, I think um, one skill that translators need to have is not only using the dictionary when they're mm -hmm. translating, of course, it's maybe your first line of defense, but it really should never be your, your last, right? I think you need to, I think, um, a book chapter I wrote recently on a process of translation that was, it ended up in specifically in a book about um, about Colinas. Um, I, I was talking about how the translator should re really kind of educate their visual imagination, right? Not just um, that you're looking at words, you're not researching words and translating just words, you're you're researching as, as um, Paul was talking about, you know, those objects. You need to know what those objects look like. If you're talking about a flower, you need to know what its form is. If you're talking about a tree, what do its leaves look like? You know, what is the shape of the of its branches? Because that might be important for something later on in in that same poem or in that book of, of poetry. So, what are the forms? Um, you know, what are the visions you're working with? If you can go visit the place, uh, one one time when I was in graduate school, I visited um, Bergamo, which is one of the cities that Colinas uses as a base for Sepulcro and Tarquinia. You know, and I was seeing some of these sites that he was talking about, and in some cases, it actually did help me to be able to see these real places places to translate that poem more accurately to show what what Colinas was talking about so you know I would say educating your your visual imagination and not not only your knowledge of languages which of course is is extremely important but also how how you see things um and you know how you see those very specific images that that poets are always trying trying to express yeah and and, and I don't want to take too much time as Paul needs to respond but just an example is this painting uh, is about a painting by Roberto Eisenberg that, and I had to find that painting to be able to, and I did, to be able to understand the description that is in this, this text. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess what I would add, I, one of the things I've noticed when I, when I started translating Spanish poetry is how much I needed to beef up on my English vocabulary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because for my daily, just kind of daily use of English, certain words you can get by with, but then in a, in a, in the context of translating poetry, it doesn't get you the same outcome. And I think kind of that, I think what, what you were getting at Maria, like that multi-dimensional aspect of a word, like there's that visual element of like, what are the different things communicated by that word? Because I think that goes beyond just what you're going to see in the dictionary. 
where it's just going to give you one or two words, but really capturing kind of the all those all those facets of it, and then trying to find words in English that can accomplish the same thing. And so for me, I, I think you have to know each language very well to kind of capture the richness of the original text and then be able to translate into another language in an equally rich way. But right. patience, I think, is a big, <laughs> a very big piece. Patience is the foundation huh, of it all. Of it all. <laughs> well, I, I want to make a comment. I'm very jealous of Maria and Rhonda because I've only had uh, the experience of translating poetry from uh, by Emily Dickinson. I haven't had the chance to ask her what she thinks of my translation. <laughs> so you are you are very fortunate uh, to, yes, to be am. able to. I'm so to happy that. that Tununa could be here today to listen. I think she's still there listening. Yes. I'm so happy. <laughs> and the other thing I was thinking about is, uh, as we know, Maria has also experienced interpreting medical Spanish. And uh, I would say there is a big difference between translating something so scientific in nature as it would be for prose or poetry because there is so much emotion subjectivity involved in the process that it, it definitely is a is a whole different experience and then Rhonda I have to tell you how much I appreciated the extra box you added to that Cajachina by your own translation it seems to me when you were uh, comparing you also were saying la traducción es un acto de sex sexualidad, de sensualidad. You were connecting it even to, to, to Nuna's work. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, an extra box was created, oh, yes. right? In the, the, the process original of and the translation inside. Fascinating. Or maybe fascinating. the original here and the translation outside, you know? Fascinating. Yeah, well, you guys did an amazing job. And we only have one minute left just to thank everyone. Thank you everyone who joined and who followed all the instructions so well. It's a shame we couldn't see everyone's reactions as we were listening to this amazing presentation. I would like to uh, add a thank you to the Louisville Gas and Electric Company because before <laughs> this happened, before this session, I lost all power in my house. So I would like to give a shout out to Louisville <laughs> Gas and Electric and who got me back on online just in time okay. thank you everyone <laughs> have a wonderful day paul wait for my email i'll be emailing you <laughs> okay thank you everyone muchas gracias a thanks todos. so much bye everyone bye, -bye. good day bye bye